church. Would you stand with me for the call to worship? Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you today in surrender, and Lord, we, we worship you today. Holy Spirit, please feel this, fill this place. Open our eyes, our hearts, our ears, that we may hear what your message is today. Please anoint Pastor Shane to bring forth your word. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
We thank you, God, for how awesome that you are. God, the splendor of you, our King. Hallelujah. May our eyes be open to your beauty. We give you the praise and the glory today. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We give you the praise, Lord. Let's sing this bridge again and into the chorus and let us just open our hearts in worshiping our great and mighty God. Remember those walls that we called skin and shore. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rumble now. Remember those giants we called death and rain. Yeah. 
who you are. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. In a moment, the ushers are going to be coming forward to receive the offering this morning. And as they do so, I just ask that you join me in prayer. Jesus, you are Lord of lords, King of kings. We are gathered here this morning to worship you, to praise you, give you thanks, and to just seek you with all that we have. This morning, as we continue to worship you and to praise you, I just ask that you bless both the gift and the giver this day. Give us as a church wisdom and guidance on how we can use these gifts further your kingdom. Father, we love you and we thank you for the blessings that you have given us, the blessings that you've poured out on us. We come and we just give back a portion of what you have given to us. We do so as cheerful givers, with thankfulness in our hearts. Bless each and every person here today. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, praise team, for leading us in, into worship this morning, and it's so good to be here worshiping with you this morning. Before we jump into our time of the message today, there are some important announcements that I want to draw your attention to, to uh, some things to have on your calendar so that way you are not missing out on them. Uh, one of the things uh, that I want to make you aware of is that there are a couple of work nights that are going to be taking place this week. Tomorrow evening, uh, Monday, at 6.30, we are going to be doing some work here in the sanctuary. So if you are free to come on out and uh, help us with those projects, feel free to do so. But then on Saturday morning as well, we will be having a whole church uh, work day where we will be gathering together to work uh, on a lot of the outside projects, getting the yard cleaned up, uh, sticks picked up, rocks cleared out. Uh, we're going to pressure wash uh, some of the church as well. Um, so that'll be Saturday. Uh, we'll be here at 9 o'clock, and it'll go till 2.30 or till we tucker out as well. So uh, there'll be lots of jobs for everybody. Uh, so if you can come, many hands make light work. Uh, so that would be Saturday morning that we'll be uh, gathering for that. Um, I haven't looked at the weather to see what Saturday looks like. Uh, and I don't know that for sure that we have a rain date yet, uh, but if weather is looking terrible, the best thing to do is to check your email, uh, check our church Facebook page, uh, or give me a call if you have any questions whether or not uh, we will be having workday on that Saturday. Also in your bulletin, you're going to see a couple of different handouts. One is our uh, Sunday, May 5th celebration service. Uh, that will be on that day, uh, for that day only, we're going to be doing one service that will be the 1030 service as we gather together and we just celebrate the blessings that God has poured out on us. We will be uh, dedicating our sanctuary, we'll be dedicating the boutique, uh, which that will be the grand opening uh, for the boutique as well. It will be the Sunday that we bring on new members who have been going through the membership class uh, with me over the last handful of weeks. Uh, there's also opportunity for baptism if you're interested in being baptized. I just need you to let me know ahead of time so we can make preparations. We'll talk a little bit about baptism and uh, get you signed up for that. So if you're interested in baptism, 
Uh, make sure you either mark it on your Connect card or you seek me, and uh, we have that discussion as well. Uh, it will also be, with it being May 5th, we're going to have a uh, potluck after the service, so we'll be gathering together for a meal. With it being Cinco de Mayo, uh, we're doing a Mexican-themed uh, potluck, and I was asked many times last week, what does that look like? What kind of dishes can we bring? The truth of it is, is that you can bring whatever dish you want, and we're not going to turn it away. We are equal opportunity eaters at this church, so uh, bring whatever you would like. Uh, we'll just have a great time that Sunday. It's also the Sunday that we will be taking time to appreciate all of our volunteers uh, here at the church as well. Uh, we'll have a small token of our appreciation uh, to give out to all the volunteers, and um, I just am looking forward to that Sunday as well. You'll also have in there, in your bulletin, uh, this card here uh, that comes from the Hands of Hope uh, Boutique, and they're doing a food drive. We're getting our... Uh, food cupboard stocked up so that way we're prepared and ready uh, for all those that will be coming and taking part of that ministry. There's instructions on that card. Take a look at that as well. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask me. Also in the bulletin uh, is our weekly activities uh, for this week. Uh, we have our Monday evening men's Bible study that meets in my office. Uh, that's at 6.30. Then on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock, uh, the women's Bible study meets here in the sanctuary. Uh, so come on out and participate in that. Uh, they're studying the Gospel of Mark uh, this time around. Uh, it's going to be a great study as well. Last but certainly not least, on the back of your bulletin, take a look at that. There is going to be, um, the, the youth group has been serving wonderfully. Uh, this past Wednesday, they went up to Beach Lake Cemetery, and they helped get uh, it all cleaned up, and a big tree had fallen, and they got that cut up and taken away, and uh, things just picked up, and uh, they've been serving uh, in this church and out in the community, which has been a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, but they are looking for additional opportunities to serve. Um, and so, if you know somebody uh, who is in need of help with cleaning up the yards or even throughout the summer needing help uh, with mowing their lawn and, and keeping up with that. If you know somebody who's moving or needs something heavy moved, uh, the teens are wanting to help. They want to serve with that. And so that those people, if you know somebody that needs help, they don't have to go to this church. Uh, they would gladly go and serve those in the community uh, that need help as well. So if you are aware of somebody or know somebody that would benefit from that help from the teenagers, let me know, or you can let Karen Sampson know or Sean Rieger know, uh, and they'll be sure to, to get in touch uh, with those people and offer the assistance of the teens. Uh, so please uh, know that they're not just saying that. Uh, the kids really do want to help. They really do want to serve. Uh, and they're, what a great example that they're setting for us as well. There's lots of other announcements. I'm sure I missed some of them. Uh, grief shares still going Thursdays at 6 o'clock. Uh, if you know somebody that would benefit from that ministry, uh, come on out with them Thursdays at 6 o'clock. At this time, let us transition into our time of prayer uh, as we ask God to prepare our hearts for the message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we again just come before you. We humble, humble ourselves before you. We just seek you. God, I ask that in this moment that you make your presence known to your people, that you speak to their hearts, that you comfort their hearts, that you hear their prayers as they lift them up to you. God, it's challenging at times for us to think how you, God of this universe, God of this world, is able to hear our prayers. But we know that you do. We know that you hear our cries. You hear our praises. So God, as we lift these up to you, we pray that your will be done. That your will be done in our lives, in our church, in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities. Father, we think of this world. 
we know that it's a world living in darkness. We know that it's a world filled with violence, filled with hatred, that is filled with people who have turned their backs on you, who have strayed away from your commands, your precepts. But Father, we also know that as this world walks in darkness, you have sent a great light. That you sent your one and only Son, the light of this world, to come and to rescue and to save this world. And that we know that you have called us, God, your sons and your daughters, to be great lights in this world. So I pray this morning that as we look to this world, we see the wars, we see the violence, we see the hatred. Father God, we pray in this moment for your peace to come in this world. We pray for an end to all of these wars, all of this violence, all of this senseless loss of life. Father God, forgive us. Forgive us for desecrating your community, your sons and your daughters. We're sorry for the destruction in this world. But Father, we know that as children of you, the Lord Most High, that we are not a hopeless people, that we don't walk in darkness, that you have given us your light, your Son, Jesus. So I pray against the temptation to hide our lights under our bushel, behind our shade. I pray that we let our light shine amongst this world. That we go sharing the hope of you, Jesus. That we go sharing your love with those in need. We know where your light is, darkness cannot overcome it. to fill us with a holy boldness, a holy courage, to not be ashamed of your gospel, to go preaching salvation only found in you. Help us to walk in the way, the truth, and the light. Help us to direct others to you, Jesus. May we be obedient to the calling that you have placed on our lives. As we hear these words from your holy word this morning. May we have a new understanding of how great you are. We know you are our God, that you save us, that you rescue us. You've pulled us out of the pit, the miry bog, and that you, God, lead us to still water. So I pray in this moment, in this morning, that you lead us to those still waters. That you overwhelm us with a sense of peace. That you give each and every person here this morning eyes to see you. Eyes to recognize you. That you give us ears that are able to hear your still, small voice. That for our hearts, we recognize, Jesus, that you are there knocking at the door. Help us to not resist you, but to surrender you and welcome you in this place. Stir us and move us, God. Have your way amongst us. May your words fall this morning like healing rain. We celebrate you and we thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray all of these things. Amen. As we start the message, yes, Neil.
Sure. Let's pray. Father, we come in this moment as we continue to echo, as we just prayed. Father, we pray for an end to these wars. We pray for the people in Israel uh, who are under attack in this moment. Father, we pray for the end of this evilness. We know these wars, these violence does not come from you. That your desire is for your people to turn back to you, to worship you, the one true God. So we not only pray for Israel in this moment, we pray for those in Iran, we pray for those in Gaza, we pray for those in the Ukraine, we pray for those in Russia. We do not forget the wars that are taking place. We think of those in Africa, we think of those in Asia, we think of those who constantly live under the threat of persecution, of violence. We pray for a ceasing for all of these things. We pray for radical transformation of people's hearts, minds, and souls, that they recognize that this is the works of the enemy, that it's not coming from you. We mourn the loss of life, whether it's those in Iran, whether it's those in Israel, whether it's those in Gaza, whether it's those anywhere in this world that senselessly lose their lives because of the evilness of others. We pray against them. We pray for a holiness in this world. We pray for God's children, your sons and daughters, the body of Christ, to be mobilized in these moments, to go sharing the good news with those in need. We join with the heavenly host as we pray, as we ache, as we yearn for you to come again, Jesus. We join with the heavenly host. We join with all of heavens. We join with all of your creation by saying, come, Lord Jesus. It's in your precious and holy name I pray all these things. Amen. So as we go into the message this morning, you'll find that it's going to be pretty applicable uh, to the state of the world that we are in. Uh, But I also want you to know that we're going to be a little bit interactive here. We're going to be a little interactive with the start of this message. I'm going to ask some questions, and I expect some answers. All right? I want you to answer back to me. Please don't let me be up here squirming and waiting. All right? Those who were here in the first service, you're muted. First question, when Jesus was here on earth, when we look at his public ministry, what subject did he speak the most on? Not repentance, not hell, not love. Not peace, not, mo- not money. Say it again, Mary. Kingdom of what? Kingdom of God in the kingdom of heaven. Mary, you get a gold star. Catch it. All righty. Good job. So he talked the most about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But that wasn't all that part of the message there was also something else that he often attached to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Any ideas what else he talked about? Not love. Somebody said it before. Repentance. Who said repentance? Okay. Who said repentance? Okay, so two gold stars. Here you go. Catch them. You missed them. Ready? Oh, hold on. we got to try to get They're in the back aisles there already. Here you go. Wonderful. He talked about repentance and the kingdom of God. That message went hand in hand together. But guess what? There was a third thing that he also fit into that message. Any idea what the third thing might be? Not quite. It's an action. Repent and 
Nope. Starts with a B. Ends in a a leave. (laughs) Believe. Good job. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is near and at hand. This was the... Oh, those who were here in the first service, you're unmuted. (laughs) Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is near and at hand. This was the message that Jesus talked most about. And it's one that we need to take into consideration. We need to say, okay, if that's what Jesus talked the most about, we certainly ought to be talking about those things as well. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is near and at hand. We think of repentance. And repentance in the original sense literally meant to be going in one direction and then head in the opposite direction. So often in our lives, we're living in sin. We know those who are living in sin, who are heading in this one direction. What does God call them to do? Repent, to head in the opposite direction. So you think of it as when we're living in sin, when we're living uh, in ways that were against God's will, we're walking in the way of sin. And that leads away from God. Repentance is that way that we get to say no to sin and turn back and walk to Him. But we think of this also, and we think of that other word that gets added in there. Believe. Boy, do we struggle with belief sometimes. So often, how many times do we say on one hand, we believe? But on the other hand, we do the exact opposite. We need to do these things because the kingdom of God is near. Jesus ushered in this new time, this new period, this new turning point in history. The climax of the story of God's repentance, or God's plan of redemption in this world comes with Jesus bringing this message, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is near at hand. We know that as Jesus ascended into heaven, after his death and his resurrection, after the 40 days that he spent uh, teaching and being with his disciples and his followers, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. That started the end days. So we know that as each day passes, we get one day closer to Jesus coming again. But you see, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't take with him the kingdom of God. He left it in control with his church, the body of Christ, his sons and his daughters, the ones who, though we are sinners, though we fall short, we have repented, we have sought him, we have given our lives over to him. And he said to one of those fallen believers, one of those sinners, Peter, the apostle, on you I will build my church. To this very day, the church is being built. The church is not defeated. The church is not done moving. God is not done with this world. To think that those in in Iran, those in Asia, those in Africa are far beyond his reaches. That is a lie of the enemy, and we speak against it. His desire is for the lost to be saved. His desire is for his kingdom to be built. We look forward to that day when Jesus comes, but we don't keep our eyes fixed on the heavens. We have work to do here on earth as it is in heaven. So turn with me to the book of Obadiah. Obadiah chapter 1, the only chapter. We're going to be picking up where we left off last week in verse 15. We'll read all the way through the remainder of the chapter, verse 21. But as you are turning there, I want to kind of remind you of what was taking place with this prophecy, what is taking place in this book. We can guess that it was written sometime in 500 B.C., And we know that it was likely written uh, right around 586, which is when Jerusalem fell. And we see there in that first part of this prophecy, we see 
Jerusalem has fallen. And they had fallen because they received judgment from God for their disobedience, for them turning away from Him, from them worshiping false idols and just being disobedient to His commandments. But we also were introduced to those in Edom. Edom was a nation that was just to the southeast of the Dead Sea. And they stood by as Jerusalem fell. And they were prideful. They were arrogant. They boasted. They stole from Israel as they fell. And Edom was lording themselves over Israel. And judgment was coming upon them. God had told them that even though you fly like an eagle up near the cliffs, they will come down. They will face judgment. In that first part of that chapter as well, you see God giving them a list of things that they should not be doing. So we're picking up here in verse 15 as we continue this prophecy against Edom and the Edomites. Verse 15 says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow, and shall be as though they had never been. So when we look at this, we see that this notion of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is not something that Jesus introduces when he comes and starts his public ministry. This is a message that God had started to develop as early as 500 years before Jesus came. But we know that it was likely even earlier than that as we read through other books in the Old Testament. We see that the kingdom of God is near upon all the nations. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. It'll be important here in a moment. But we also have this second part here. It says, as you have done, it shall be done to you. We have there that notion of reap what you sow. Right? What goes around comes around. But then there's that last part of verse 15 that says, your deeds shall return on your own head. So we look at this, and Obadiah is doing what most prophets do. They give a glimpse of the coming future with the present conditions being taken into consideration. They give a glimpse as to what is to come in the future, but they keep the present in mind as well. It's the future meeting the present. And a lot of times with these prophecies of judgment, they're showing and they're unveiling this coming future for the people if they don't change or if they don't turn back to God, this judgment is going to come in this way. We look at it and we pick it up from where we left off last week and we see for Edom, the boasting and the pride and the arrogance, it might be happening now. It might be taking place. But judgment is eventually going to come. God is going to judge the Edomites. So as we looked at these first two verses, 15 and 16, we see Edom, their prideful self, with puffed up chests, thinking that they are great, that they are exempt from the suffering that Israel and Jerusalem is going through. But when this prophet, Obadiah, comes and shares these messages, especially that last part of verse 15, your deeds shall return on your own heads, they should have remembered what God had said in His Word previously about the treatment of others and how they are to treat especially their enemies. You'll remember the first part, that list of do not do this to those in Israel, those in Jerusalem. They should have remembered what God had said. Like the one in Proverbs chapter 25, starting in verse 20 to 21. Great words that we need to take into consideration today. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Rather than the boasting, the stealing, the looting, 
and all of these things that Edom was doing to Jerusalem. They should have seen a hurting person and offered them bread to eat. They saw a thirsty people and they should have given water to drink. And when you do that, when you act in that way, what is it like? It is like heaping burning coals over that person that cleanses them, that makes them whole, that gives them hope and love. In acting that way, the Lord sees it. And the Lord will bless that and reward that. Look in verse 17. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possession. So here in verse 17, we have the transition point in this prophecy. We have a shift taking place from the judgment on Edom to the good news for those in Zion, where pride and violence led to judgment of Edom. We see here this idea that for those in Zion, those who have been humbled, that it will one day again be a holy place. And that those in the house of Jacob shall possess their own possession. Remember, this is to a people that have been destroyed, a people that have been separated, a people that have been broken down. This is good news coming for them. You see, because those who are humble, those who have been humble, are dependent on God's mercy. They have nothing left but to depend on God's mercy. We are reminded once again of the opposite to pride. The opposite of pride is humbleness. It is humbleness. And God's Word tells us that for those to be humble, those who are seeking righteousness, It requires them to live by faith. For we walk by faith, not by sight. When I was studying my undergrad, one of my favorite professors, his name was Casey Davis. And when he was in college, he was quite the athlete. He was a basketball player. And he was quite proud of being a basketball player. He was good. He was selected to play in an all-star game. But even better than that, he was selected to take part of the slam dunk contest during the All-Star game. But he was a Christian as well. And he recognized that he was a bit prideful, that pride was getting the best of him. He thought a lot of his abilities and knew that he was good. And so he said a prayer, God, my pride is getting in the way. Humble me. Careful with prayers like that. Because God did humble him. He bent over to tie his shoes. And threw out his back. And he was not able to participate in the slam dunk contest or the all-star game. The back injury that he received as he was humbled by God stays with him to this very day that there were many times that he would have to cancel class because his pain was so severe that he couldn't get out of bed. But he continues to serve the Lord. He continues to give him praise. He continues to recognize that if he wasn't humbled in that moment, his trajectory and his life path might have become very different if his pride was what continued to guide him. We, when we recognize that we are being prideful, that our chests are being puffed out. We need to take the time to pray that God humbles us. And we need to be ready to receive the results of that prayer. There's another minor prophet by the name of Habakkuk. In chapter 2, verse 4 of his book, he states, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. As we seek righteousness, as we seek God, we do so by faith. Look at verse 18. 
The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the lands of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negeb. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. We look at this and we see a picture being painted for us. The house of Jacob, the house of Joseph, the house of Israel, the house of Jerusalem is going to be like a fire, like a flame. They're going to be a light in the world. A city on a hill. But we see the house of Esau is going to crumble. It is going to fall. The Lord spoke these things. But we see with this prophecy that ultimately what Obadiah and what God is doing is telling those in exile, those who are captive, those who are defeated, those who are abused, and those who have been abandoned, that God sees them. God notices them. And he has not forgotten them. That in that moment, in those words, he is letting those people that are broken down, letting them know that the promises that God made to their forefathers, the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're going to be fulfilled. They have not been forgotten. Even today as we read these words, we can look at the scope of history. We can see how things have unfolded. And we have a different understanding than how the original audience first received this prophecy. When this first was given, the Edomites, they would have found this difficult. They would have heard these words of judgment against them. And hopefully they would have been fearful of God. That they would have taken notice of what he was saying. But they certainly would have been difficult. For those in Zion, it would have been a reminder of God's promises, of His love, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. And they would have welcomed this message. But the sorrows last for the night. Joy comes. But even in the time of the New Testament, as these prophecies pointed toward Jesus, as they pointed towards the coming Messiah, even in the time of the New Testament, a bigger picture was beginning to unfold of what these words meant. You see, it turns out, but even by the time of the New Testament, a new understanding about the kingdom of God was unfolding. The kingdom of God was much bigger than just that and Israel. This is God of the whole world. God of creation. To think that he would confine himself to just that one small little nation becomes to be a little bit silly to think that. But the kingdom of God is for the whole world. For all those who believe in him. Who believe that he sent his one and only son into this world. So that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We see it in the book of Galatians as the Apostle Paul is writing to the early church. In chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We're going to pause just for a moment there. And to recognize and understand how radical it is what Paul just wrote. And what he told the church. That we are all children of God through faith. That when we pursue righteousness, when we pursue God, when we live our lives by faith, 
We are His children. We don't have to be born to a certain race in a certain area in this world. This gift is for all who believe. But allow yourself to think for that moment that as you live your lives by faith, each and every morning when you get up, allow yourself to think, I'm clothing myself in Christ today. I am clothing myself in Christ today. Super cool. But then we have verse 28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's super duper cool. We look at that and we see that we get to be a part and, in, and receive the inheritance that was promised to Abraham so long ago. We see also in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, is this a reminder that, that Paul is writing to the church in Rome. He says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. <gasps> Super duper duper cool that we see here that as we pursue this righteousness of faith, that God knew what he was doing. As far back as when he was speaking through the prophets, he had a way for us. Paul, who was the apostle to the Gentiles, is sharing the good news that for you and I, most of us are Gentiles. We get to inherit this promise. We get to see through this that God's kingdom will be the whole earth. It will be the whole earth. We hear it in Jesus' words when he tells us the meek, who is the humble, who is those pursuing righteousness, those who live their lives by faith. The meek will inherit the what? Oh boy, I'm running out of ways to say this is super duper 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 cool. But we also have words like that in the Old Testament. In Psalms chapter 22, verses 27 through 29. We often forget a lot of the Psalms work as prophecy as well. Speak of a, a better future, a better world. Here in this Psalm, we hear, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. We see this again, God's kingdom going to the expanses of this earth. From the very beginning to the very end. And with all of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before Him. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We look at this, and we see what is the problem in our world, is that we see nations who are puffed up and proud. Every nation thinks that they are the best nation. There is pride and there is arrogance. But not only is it those nations doing those things, including our very own, it's the people in those nations who have turned from God. Who have turned from God. God's message remains the same. His desire for all people in all nations is for them to turn back to Him, to worship Him, to repent of their sin, to believe that He is the one true God. And to understand that His kingdom is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of heaven. It is near. It is at hand. That this kingdom is God. He is the one. But you see, we are His sons and daughters. We are filled with His Holy Spirit. We are sent on a mission. We are witnesses sent into this world. To Judea to Samaria, 
and to the very ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. Read it. And understand that as we go about this world, it is not ours. It is God's. And He will rule. And one day, every knee will bow and tongue confess that He, Jesus, is Lord. So I have three takeaways for you this week. Three things that I want you to remember. Three things for you to think about. The first is this. The day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. And we know from God's Word that the day of the Lord, it's going to be a day of God's wrath and judgment. It's going to be a day of God's wrath and judgment. But it is also going to be a day of salvation and a day of rejoicing. To which will you belong? If you find yourself prideful and arrogant, separated from God, or do you instead find yourself humble, pursuing righteousness, living by faith? The second is this. The righteous shall be humble and live by faith. That comes from God's Word. And I understand fully, and you understand fully as well, that by being humble and living by faith, this is countercultural. It is countercultural, but it's scripturally mandated. Being humble and living by faith is countercultural, but it's scripturally mandated. The third thing for us to remember today is that revenge and repayment belongs to the Lord, not us. Revenge and repayment belongs to the Lord, not us. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. In Rome. He's writing to the persecuted church. Understand that as he is writing this letter to the Romans, to the Roman church, people are being persecuted, they're being arrested, and they're being put to death. And he writes these things in chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, Paul says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Sounds familiar? A little bit of a deja vu moment there, right? But verse 21 says, do not be, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The world has enough darkness, enough hatred, enough violence. We need to take seriously this call from God. As He calls us to humble ourselves, to seek Him. We're called to be witnesses. As Paul said here to the church in Rome, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You are witnesses to, to the salvation, the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness, and the love of God found through His Son, Jesus Christ. You are witnesses to that. And whether you're aware of it or not, people are watching you. They are seeing how you live. They are seeing what you do. Don't blow your witness. Don't hide your light. Share the good news. Be and share the hope of Jesus his love, his grace, his mercy and forgiveness. By doing that, you will be obedient sons and daughters. By doing that, the Lord will see it. He will remember it and he will bless it. 
Do not be overcome by evil. We are not a fearful people. Fear, anxiety, worry, stress does not come from God. Those are lies of the enemy being fed into us. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. We do not need to be afraid of evil. We have the power to overcome evil with good. Let us pray. Jesus, we think of those in our world right now that are feel, filled with fear. We pray for them. I pray for the body of Christ in this moment. I pray that as we see all of this evil taking place around us, we know that we don't have any responsibility to repay evil for evil that that is in your hands, that you will be the one who avenges. But God, for those that you're trying to get to pay attention, those that you're trying to get to take notice, those that you're even in this moment pouring your judgment out upon, may they see you, may they seek you, may they repent of your, their ways, may they believe that you are God, and may they recognize your kingdom. So Father, I pray for your children today. I pray for those in this place that need to repent of their sin, that need to ask you to forgive them of their sin in their lives. But I also pray for those that might be struggling with their belief. I pray that you make your presence known to them, that you draw them close to you, that you speak to their hearts in this moment. And I pray that each and every one of us be your witnesses in this world, that we recognize your kingdom is this whole earth, that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only Son, that all who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. May this be the good news that we share. Help us to not be ashamed of the gospel, but to preach the salvation that comes to both Jew and Gentile alike. We love you, God, that you love your world, that you love your creation. We ask that you forgive us for desecrating it, for destroying it, but we know that you are a great redeemer, that you could save this world. And we ask that you do so in Jesus' name. Would you stand as we close our service with this song, Jehovah? As we sing, would you just call on the name of the Lord? Call on his name for those needs in your life, for those people that you have been praying for. He is our God, our healer, our provider, our peace. <clears throat> All throughout the Bible, there are verses that say, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. All throughout Psalms, people call on the Lord. Let's do that as we close our service today. He shames every idol. He reigns without rival. He goes by the name of Jehovah. Oh
as we sang those songs, as we called upon our God, the one true God. Jehovah Nisi fights our battles. The battle belongs to Him. Jehovah Jireh meets our needs. He wants you to bring your needs before Him, to trust in Him, and that His will be done in your lives. Jehovah Rapha heals our bodies. Our God is a healer. Our God does miracles. Our God heals in Jesus' name. Jehovah, Jehovah Shalom is our peace. May you receive the peace of God. May it flow on us this morning. As you leave this place, go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go, be witnesses to His salvation, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. God bless each and every one of you. you want to play that song out? <laughs>